and I've been a nun in the uh, forest sangha tradition of Theravada Buddhism since 1979 when I was uh, entered in Chithurst Monastery just after it had been established. And Ajahn Sumedho was my preceptor and there were three other sisters, including Ajahn Sundara, who some of you will probably know. So four of us to start off with. And uh, I've been in this community ever since. Uh, currently I'm living uh, in a monastery in Scotland, uh, but right now until the end of this Vasa, I'm at Amrawati Monastery in Hertfordshire. So this is the Amarawati Shrine Room, and this is the Amarawati Shrine uh, just behind me. So um, this evening, following the traditional uh, form, we'll start off with uh, some chanting, which will come up on your screen. It's actually the morning chanting, but it's almost identical with the evening chanting. Uh, and so you're welcome to chant along with me um, at home, as long as you stay muted. Uh, after the chanting, there'll be the request for the refuges and precepts. And Imogen may not be here in time. And so um, what I'll do after the evening chanting is to see if any of you would like to make the formal request for the refuges and precepts. And that also will be up on the screen, so you don't have to know it off by heart. And then you can stay unmuted and chant along um, uh, doing the responses when, when I when I give the precepts. That would be very, very, very helpful if one of you were able to do that. And if you don't feel you can do Pali, you can do it in English. Uh, so I'll give you a little time to think about it and we'll start off with, I'll light the candles and the incense, which are the traditional offerings to the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha. And then I'll chant, um, I'll chant in English this evening so that you'll, understand what I'm saying. And as I said, you're welcome to chant along with me. To the blessed one, the Lord, who fully attained perfect enlightenment, through the teaching which he expounded so well, and to the blessed one's disciples who have practiced well, to these the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, we render with offerings our grateful homage. It is well for us that the Blessed One, having attained liberation, still had compassion for later generations. May these simple offerings be accepted for our long-lasting benefit and for the happiness it gives us. The Lord, the perfectly enlightened and blessed one, 
I render homage to the Buddha, the Blessed One. The teaching so completely explained by him, I bow to the Dhamma. The Blessed One's disciples who have practiced well, I bow to the Sangha. Now let us pay a preliminary homage to the Buddha. Homage to the Blessed, noble and perfectly enlightened one. Homage to the Blessed, noble and perfectly enlightened one. Homage to the Blessed, noble and perfectly enlightened one. Now let us chant in praise of the Buddha. The Tathagata is the pure one, the perfectly enlightened one. He is impeccable in conduct and understanding, the accomplished one, the knower of the worlds. He trains perfectly those who wish to be trained. He is teacher of gods and humans. He is awake and holy in this world with its gods, demons and kind spirits, its seekers and sages, celestial and human beings. He has by deep insight revealed the truth. He has pointed out the Dhamma, beautiful in the beginning, beautiful in the middle, beautiful in the end. He has explained the spiritual life of complete purity in its essence and conventions. I chant my praise to the Blessed One. I bow my head to the Blessed One. Now let us chant in praise of the Dhamma. The Dhamma is well expounded by the Blessed One, apparent here and now. Timeless, encouraging investigation, leading in words to be experienced individually by the wise. I chant my praise to this teaching. I bow my head to this truth. Now let us chant in praise of the Sangha. They are the Blessed One's disciples who have practiced well, who have practiced directly, who have practiced insightfully, those who practice with integrity. That is the four pairs, the eight kinds of noble being. These are the Blessed One's disciples. Such ones are worthy of gifts, worthy of hospitality, worthy of offerings, worthy of respect. They give occasion for incomparable goodness to arise in the world. I chant my praise to this Sangha. I bow my head to this Sangha.
So I'm wondering if there's anybody who would be willing to uh, make the formal request for the three refuges and the five precepts. Um, if you raise your hand, either your virtual hand or your, your actual hand, and then Wandu can unmute you so you can uh, make the request. Is there anybody who can do that? Oh, yeah. Uh, Carola. Yes. yes. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Do we bow first? So if you bow first and then make the request, that would be fine. Mayam aye tisarinina saha, pancha silani achama. Dutiam pi mayam aye tisaranena saha, pancha silani achama. Tatiam pi mayam aye tisaranena saha, pancha silani achama. So that's the formal request, and now I'm going to recite Namo Tassa three times, and uh, Carola, if you'd like to chant it three times out loud so everyone can hear and so I can hear, and then we'll go through the three refuges, uh, the refuge in Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha, um, and then the five precepts, and we'll do the five precepts both in Pali and in English, and I think I'll just check that I get the right wording, because... Mm. Yeah. So <clears throat> we'll begin. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambodhasa. 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 Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Buddham saranam gachami. Buddham saranam gachami. Dhammam saranam gachami. Dhammam saranam gachami. Sangham saranam gachami. Sangham saranam gachami. Dutiam pi budham saranam gachami. Dutiam pi budham saranam gachami. Dutiam pi dhammam saranam gachami. Dutiam pi dhammam saranam gachami. Dutiam pi sankhang saranam gachami. Dutiam pi sankham saranam gachami. Tatiam pi budhang saranam gachami. Tatiam pi budham saranam gachami. Tatiampi dhammang saranam gachami. Tatiampi dhammam saranam gachami. Tatiampi sankhang saranam gachami. Tatiampi sankham saranam gachami. Isaranat gamananititang. 
ama aye. Panati pata, where of money, see carpadang, somebody hummy. Panati pata, where of money, see carpadang, somebody hummy. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. Adina dana where money see kapadang samadhi hami. Adina dana where money see kapadang samadhi hami. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not given. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not given. Kame sumi chachara, where of money si kapadang samadhi hami. Kame sumi chachara, where of money si kapadang samadhi hami. I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. Musawada, where of money, si kapadang samadhi hami. Musawada, where of money, si kapadang samadhi hami. I undertake the precept to refrain from lying. I undertake the precept to refrain from lying. Sura Miraya Majapamada Tana, where of money see Kapadang Samadi Hami. Sura Miraya Majapamada Tana, where of money see Kapadang Samadi Hami. I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drink and drugs which lead to carelessness. I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drink and drugs which lead to carelessness. Imani panchasi kapadani si lena sugatinyanti si lena boga sampada. Si lena ni puting yanti tasamasi lang wi so taye. Sadu, sadu, sadu. Thank you very much, Karada. That was that was wonderful. I always enjoy that ritual of the determining of the three refuges and five precepts because when we chant these things out loud and normally we would do it in a group all together, really it's like a way of putting your, your mind and your heart and your whole body into, into doing something that can be a, a tremendous support, uh, just the, the bringing to mind the, the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha, these refuges, this potential that each one of us has to live um, according to truth, according to reality, attuned to reality, rather than um, lost in a world of um, ideas or um, a misperception of how things actually are, a misunderstanding. Uh, so we, we recollect the, the refuges and then the precepts, which are this very simple undertaking in our lives, simple guidelines, suggestions about how we can live life in a way that is going to uh, support um, well-being, a sort of well-being of the heart. We may not always feel well, and you know, over the last couple of years, people have been sick, people have died from the pandemic and other illnesses. Uh, but there can always we can always maintain a wellness of heart when we make our make make 
make an effort, do our best uh, to live following these guidelines to refrain from causing harm to other creatures, uh, any kind of dishonest dealings with others, stealing, taking what hasn't been given to us, sexual misconduct, you know, um, taking, um, exploiting other people for our own pleasure or just misusing our own, our own bodies, um, lying, cheating, um, gossiping, using harsh speech, abusive speech, using speech in ways that don't support well-being either for her, ourselves or for anybody else. And uh, avoiding substances that confuse and cloud the mind, that distort our perception, that affect our judgment of what's appropriate in any, in any given situation. So I, I just love the fact that we have, you know, very simple, short ceremony that uh, we can really, it's like um, just kind of imbuing our whole being with these very um, supportive uh, elements um, for our life. Um, so what we'll do now is we'll, we'll spend some time in meditation, uh, sitting quietly together. I encourage you to find a, a suitable posture. I'm going to just shift to the cross-legged position, which I find supports mindfulness. We want to find a position that is stable and um, reasonably comfortable, not so comfortable that we're falling asleep. And some of you may be feeling a bit sleepy after the end of a, a long day, you've been working or um, doing demanding, uh, tiring different activities or just being out and about in the streets of London is pretty tiring <laughs> without doing anything, I find. So it's a chance just to sit quietly, but we, we try to have a posture that supports um, a sense of alertness, a sense of presence. So our meditation is about being present. I usually like to use the breath as the main focus for my awareness. And also to maintain a sense of bodily ease and well being. So, taking time to, to relax the body. Just relaxing the head scalp, the face particularly. And just notice if there's tension, particularly around the forehead. See if you can imagine just breathing it away, just directing the breath, like a gentle shower through the muscles, taking away any tension, pain, discomfort. Letting the shoulders drop. Letting the arms relax, the hands rest loosely on the knees or in the lap. Bringing the awareness into the trunk of the body, the heart center. Releasing, relaxing, softening, opening in the heart center. The solar plexus area, the middle part of the body. Breathing right down into the belly, full deep breaths. It's really taking time to breathe fully and completely. A deep relaxing, a deep putting down of all our burdens, all our concerns, concerns of the day, worries for the future. 
just enjoying a deep sense of ease. Ease of bodily presence. Releasing tension in the legs, thighs, knees, calves, ankles, feet. Releasing tension in the back part of the body. Breathing away any feeling of tightness from around the muscles, the muscles around the spine. And the body is nicely supported. A sense of ease, a sense of balance, poise, alertness attending to this moment as we experience it. Using the breath as a reference point, attuning to the breath as it happens, as we experience it here, now. Aware of thinking, remembering the thoughts of the, the, the events of the day, thoughts for the future, and trying to avoid getting caught up in these. Just leave them be, keeping the awareness with the breath, with the body, as we experience it right now. If you want to use a word or a phrase as an extra support, an extra reminder, that's something that's quite all right, can be very helpful. Bud as you breathe in, do as you breathe out, bud do, or some secular word or phrase, here, now whatever you find helpful. And whenever you notice that the mind has been pulled away into some fascinating memory or disturbing, confusing, troubling memory, or some exciting plan for the future. As soon as you notice that this has happened, simply come back. Come back to the breath, come back to the moment as you experience it right now. Finding a sense of peace, a sense of ease, of pleasure, just in this one breath, as it's happening, here, now.
If the mind is very active, try not to make a problem about it. It's quite normal after a busy day for the mind to still be turning things over, remembering, worrying. These are normal things for the mind. And we just gently turn aside and come to the simplicity of this moment as we experience it through the body. Relaxing through the body, tending to the breath. You don't need to try to sort anything out. Just giving space. Allowing the mind to rest calmly, quietly. Just one breath and then the next breath. Try to stay alert, attentive. Don't let the mind get too drifty and dreamy, drowsy. And if that's happening for you, then you put effort into the posture, sitting nice and straight, attending to the breath. Opening the eyes if you're very, very sleepy. Or even standing up for a few moments. So that you're fully present, alert, attentive to this moment as you experience it.
You may hear the sound of the aeroplane going by overhead here at Amrawati. Or perhaps there are traffic sounds or other sounds in the next room, street sounds. These needn't be a problem, just leave them be. Noticing sound without entangling ourselves in a struggle to uh, shut it out or feel it shouldn't be there. Just part of our present moment experience, part of what's happening here, now. No problem. And still breathe, we can still notice the breathing directly, one breath, and then the next breath.
Just keep coming back. Coming back to the moment. Finding pleasure, just resting here, now, with this breath, this body, as we experience it.
seeing this practice, this meditation as being the kindest thing we can do for ourselves. It's not like a chore or a challenge that we have to succeed at or do well at, but simply a kind of humble application, patiently being present with conditions as they are, with a heart of kindness, and kindness towards ourselves. May this being be well. May he or she be free from every kind of suffering, every kind of struggle. Just this kindly, friendly attitude that we can bring up, that we can bring into our awareness. And extending it to any beings that we know who are struggling in any way, sick or experiencing some kind of mental torment or difficulty. We can include them, this thought, may they be well, may they find inner steadiness, well-being. I'm just taking a little time to allow the awareness to spread. Touching beings that we know, <clears throat> and also those that we don't know, but we know of, that we know about. The Buddha talks about <clears throat> these boundless, immeasurable qualities, kindliness, compassion, joyfulness, serenity. Extending the heart to encompass all beings everywhere. May they be well. May they be free from every kind of suffering, every kind of struggle. May they experience gladness and joy. And the calm, perfect understanding.
with us being here be well. <clears throat> with us being here, no inner ease, steadiness, well-being. Thank you. <clears throat> One of the things that I found most encouraging in the teachings of the Buddha was this capacity we have as human beings, this potential to maintain a sense of inner steadiness inner well-being, no matter where we are, no matter what we're doing, what conditions that we're experiencing. And it's something I like to talk about, particularly after a period of practice together, you know, either med meditation we've just had or uh, during a retreat when people can, you know, under normal circumstances, they can come to the monastery and spend some days just practicing together and uh, experiencing a sense of inner calm. And often there's a question, you know, how can I maintain this, you know, after I go away from the retreat, after I, um, when I um, end a period of meditation, how can, I mean, how can I maintain this uh, sense of inner calm, inner balance? And it's something we learn how to do gradually. Um, my sense is that it's important to uh, distinguish the inner calm uh, of knowing, uh, of the refuge in the Buddha, Dhamma Sangha, to distinguish that from the normal day-by-day um, -day level of mental activity. You know, we tend to think when the mind is calm and peaceful in meditation, that this is something that we should be able to maintain in our daily life. And of course, it'd be lovely if, if we could. Um, but daily life doesn't uh, really provide the conditions to support uh, that continuous state of um, mental uh, calm, a mental act this is sort of like no mental activity. You know, when we're um, moving around, seeing different things, experiencing different kinds of stimulation, uh, talking to people, uh, traveling, uh, just seeing all kinds of sights and sounds and experiencing different tastes and smells. And like walking around London at this time of the night, it's very, very stimulating for, for all of the senses, There's bright lights and uh, sound of traffic and music and people talking and the smells of the streets. I always notice when I come to the Buddhist society, you know, as you know, we, we don't eat afternoon as, as nuns in this tradition. So walking around London, all these incredibly enticing fragrances of different kinds of food. Everywhere people seem to be preparing food and cooking delicious food. And so... Uh, this is, this is a lot of, lot of sensory impingement uh, in, our, in our daily life. Uh, the interactions we have with one another, going to work, the challenges of um, difficult situations, um, problems, yes. and even living in the monastery. There are many different things that we need to deal with. You know, people sometimes think that monastic life is you know, just one calm, peaceful experience. And 
you know, as we cultivate our refuge in Buddha Dhamma Sangha, that certainly, you know, for some of us, some of the time, there's a sense of 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 inner and having a perspective on things when there's real mindfulness. But you know, we also have you know, interactions that can sometimes be quite difficult. Um, you know, people sometimes don't get along, don't agree um, about different things, and you know, certainly since I've lived in the monastery more than 40 years, there have been you know, times when I've felt you know, um, quite um, intense feelings of rage, for example. You know, when somebody, you know, I have an idea about something and you know, I really feel this is the best way to do something. I really want this thing to happen. Put a lot of energy into kind of making it happen in a particular way. And then somebody comes along and has a different idea. You know, and expresses it quite strongly. I can feel very um, disturbed by that. Uh, or I might hear some very upsetting news. Uh, somebody's died, somebody I'm very fond of, perhaps, or somebody's really sick. You know, I might feel really concerned, or somebody going through a really difficult time. In the monastery, we, you know, every day we hear of people in extremely difficult situations and you know, when they're people that we don't really know there can be a sense of concern and then sometimes you know over the years you, you know, I get to know many people very well and you know a real genuine concern for how they're doing and you know, if I hear that they've had some you know, terrible misfortune I can feel very um, you know I can feel upset about that or close family members, and so on. So that even in the monastery, there are things that can be um, distressing. So the, the challenge is as to how to, how to um, maintain a perspective on these things so uh, that we maintain, um, or we, we move towards uh, that capacity, uh, what the Buddha referred to as the unshakable deliverance of the heart. You know, this phrase that I often quote from the Mahamangala Sutta, the discourse on, on the greatest blessings. Uh, you know, though living in the world, yet the heart does not tremble, or though touched by the things of the world, the heart does not tremble freed from sorrow, confusion, need. So that heart of knowing, that, that place of refuge in the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha, that is not, that doesn't tremble, you know, that, that understands that this is how life is. Sometimes it's truly wonderful. You know, we have blissful, um, intensely joyful, experiences, you know, was, you know, in the Sangha, there are times and it's just really delightful, delightful moments. You know, we had a vineyard discussion just this, this afternoon, it's a man's gathering. We, 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 we meet a couple of times a week during the Vasa to talk about our monastic discipline and somehow today the mood was very light uh, and very joyful and you know, people were sharing their experiences and, you know, we laughed a lot. A very, uh, a, you know, lovely, a lovely time. Other times it's really, really difficult. You know, people, you know, can have quite intense uh, difficulties. And this is the nature of human beings living together. And yet we use those experiences um, as a way of establishing a perspective as a way of really deepening our understanding and our appreciation of the nature of reality, the nature of our existence, that things are changing. <laughs> you know, they can't always be wonderful. We can enjoy when they're wonderful and we can bear with, patiently bear with when they're, when they're not wonderful, when they're difficult. So in our, in our daily life, uh, we, we, we recollect 
the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha. This is why it's so wonderful to have that phys physical gestures that we can make. You know, earlier this evening, when we took the refuges and precepts, we had the puja. So it's like actually kind of like a, a kind of a programming, but a very skillful programming, program of, programming of the whole of our being, imbuing the whole of our being, recollecting the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha. You know, we have that capacity to see things clearly, to realize that things are changing, that there's no point grasping onto the wonderful experiences. I mean, it'd be stupid for me to say, well, can't, can't we kind of keep this veneer session, this particular moment when sister so-and-so made this remark and everybody you know, had a moment of shared joy. Can, can I keep that? You know, can't I keep it? Well, in a sense you can. There's a memory, you can remember the occasion. You know, if you're feeling really glum and hopeless, you know, well, actually there was, a, there was that moment, <laughs> that joyful moment. You know, you could, you could have that there as a, as a little, as a resource, but don't, don't grasp it. Don't try to make it last. It can't. Life is continuously changing. So the Buddha is one who knows, who sees clearly, you know, who can enjoy it, but who doesn't grasp onto it, trying to make it last as a perpetual state. That would be really foolish. It's beautiful phrase that Ajahn Sumedho sometimes quotes, and I really can't remember where it's from, like something like, kiss the moment as it flies, something like that. And I see that very much as like taking refuge in Dhamma. You know, it's just like allowing, allowing each moment to touch us. Um, and some moments are blissful and some moments are, are less blissful, but it's just, a, it's just a moment. So the Buddha knows that knows that things are changing. It knows that they're totally unsatisfactory. And it also knows that there's nothing in any of it that we need to identify with. You know, certainly they're part of this particular being's experience. Uh, but it would be foolish to try to hold on to my triumphant moments and, so that I can all, only think of myself as being successful you know, that, that, that wonderful moment or that terrible moment when I really blew it or when I was blamed and I felt really upset and confused and disappointed and hopeless. You know, it'd be foolish to grasp that as, as me. You know, it's, it's just a condition that I've experienced and it's part of, part of the flow of life. So we, you know, the Buddha is one who knows that it's changing that it's unsatisfactory, and there's absolutely no point in identifying with it. It, it certainly can, can make an impression, it can be part of our conditioning, but it's not who and what we are. You know, it's the condition we need to understand. You know, certainly our conditioning will affect how we respond to situations. So we try to you know, cultivate skillful habits, you know, do good things, you know, practice generosity, practice kindness, um, try to restrain, like the precepts are all about restraining, you know, avoiding acting on impulses that are going to cause harm to ourselves or to somebody else. You know, taking care about how we, how we use speech, you know, not, not just blurting things out, feeling that we have a right to express ourselves, to say what we want. I mean, we do have that right, we can. But is this really what the Buddha was encouraging? The Buddha was encouraging restraint, skillful restraint. So we may be really upset about something, but we try to avoid just blurting out, reacting. You know, instead there's wise restraint, care, you know, because we care for ourselves, we care for one another. We don't, uh, as far as possible, consciously do things or say things that are going to be harmful. Instead, when we have a wholesome impulse, then we follow that. To be generous, to be kind, to say something that's going to uh, support uh, understanding, clarity, uh, support a sense of uh, bringing uh, reconciliation, you know, supporting 
you know, harmony in community, supporting a sense of friendliness among people, you know, rather than perpetuating a sense of division. You know, so there are many ways that we can uh, reflect on like the, the Buddha, that which sees clearly the Dhamma, the truth of this moment. Just knowing how the body is coming to the breath, you know, relaxing in the moment. Just simple, practical things, like in our, in our daily life. We're just enjoying a cup of tea. And by that I mean really, you know, drinking it mindfully. Drinking, you know, just noticing picking up the cup, taking a sip. You know, I'm actually shocked at how sometimes I drink a cup of tea and I, I'm hardly aware that I've drunk it. You know, I know that I started off with a full cup and now the cup's empty. How did that happen? I'm sure you've all experienced that. So making these little aditanas, little resolution. I'm going to enjoy this cup of tea. <laughs> I'm going to really enjoy this cup of tea. Be with it. Uh, enjoy doing the washing up. Uh, sometimes people are surprised when I say that. They think, well, this washing up's a really boring troublesome thing. I mean, people have dishwashers now, so they don't have to do washing up. But actually washing up, washing up is, up, is, all, is all right. Even if you don't have any hot water, even if you've only got a very little bit of cold water, you can still enjoy the process. When there's mindfulness, it actually doesn't need to be unpleasant when you really attend to what you're doing. I mean, I'm not very good about cleaning you know, cleaning houses, my room, I'm not very good about it. But when I put attention into it, you know, sometimes I put it off and I don't do it because there's other more important things I need to be doing, you know, important conversations or emails or something like that. But when I actually make the time, you know, I say, okay, Chanda Siri, now between three and between half past three, that's the time for cleaning your room. And sometimes I do that because that's, that's the only way I can get it done. So I do that, and when I do that, I actually enjoy it. I'm just actually attending to things, taking care with things. And it might sound incredibly mundane, and it is incredibly mundane, but this is how we breathe Dhamma into our life and you know, make our life a continuous practice by just attending to really simple, ordinary things. You're know, walking along the street. Do you know that you're walking along the street? getting into the underground, finding a seat, sitting down. Do we know that we're doing that? And just being there, alert, attentive, just looking around at the people. And, you know, maybe among all those hundreds of people, you may spot one other person who's doing the same thing, you know, who's noticing. Or maybe you see somebody who's sitting in meditation. Occasionally I notice you know, on a, on, a, on a train or a bus, you know, somebody just sitting, obviously composed, alert, quiet. Occasionally I see that. And then having a sense of concern and compassion for the ones who are lost, who are not there, who are in their own world. You know, you can notice that, but not judging, not criticizing, but more a sense of, you know, kindly concern. Compassion, and then bringing up the, the Brahma Viharas that I spoke about. Kindness, may they be well. Compassion, may they be free from suffering. Gladness for the ones who seem to be okay. May they enjoy, may they not be parted from the good fortune they've attained. And this calm of knowing, this serenity of knowing, this is how it is. This is, this is human existence that I'm part of, that we're part of. So life as a human being is challenging, is difficult. Uh, living in a big city, you know, it, there's many, many things that we can think of as making it more difficult. But maybe we can also think of it as presenting a, an interesting challenge, opportunities for applying these teachings, very simple teachings and guidelines that the Buddha gave us, the refuges, the presets, 
anicca, dukkha, anatta. That's really all we need. We just need to use them, apply them, moment by moment, or at least as much as we can. And then if we've lost it, if we've blown it, if we've completely made a mess of things, never mind. How does that feel, bringing awareness to that? And can I pick myself up and begin again? Uh, not being crushed by our failures, not being blown away by our successes, maintaining presence, maintaining mindfulness. So these are just a few reflections, a few ideas about, about life in this human realm that we're all sharing, all participating in. And what I'd like to do now, we've got another 15, 20 minutes or so, is to give an opportunity uh, in case there are any questions. And what I suggest is if you wanted to write your question down and then either Wandu or um, Imogen, if she's there, can read it out and I can have a go at answering them. Um, and if you would rather just raise your hand and ask your question, then Wandu will kindly unmute you. So I might get it so I can see you all. And um, you're welcome to um, ask away if, there, if there's anything that any of you would like to ask, them, either about something I've said or just about things relating to your own practice in daily life. And I always say to people, don't worry, they don't have to be good questions. Um, but often the questions that you might feel are really foolish are actually things that everybody would like to ask, but don't quite um, know how to ask them. So. Are there any questions? Hi, Jude. If you want to ask the question, you can unmute. Thank yeah. you. Um, thank you for the meditation, sister, and um, also for the, the teaching. Um, I particularly liked your emphasis on how to breathe Dhamma into our lives. But that was lovely. Um, this isn't actually a question. This is a thank you, because... Um, some months ago, back in the summer, uh, you were talking about how it is when we're with people who have, are in extreme difficulties and seem to go round and round with problems and you know, can't seem to see a way out and, and what difficulties that presents for us. And um, I asked you about how to deal with that, how to approach that really, um, with somebody who you're very close to in your own family. Yes, and, yes. Uh, you gave some very careful advice uh, and you did say to let you know how I got on with it. <laughs> so that's what I'm doing. Um, you, you said to really, really listen very, very carefully. Um, and you also said that you might be, I might, one might be surprised by what comes up. What, yeah. and you may find you say things that you hadn't even really thought you were going to say, but things will come from the heart, which yeah. was also proved to be true. Um, and you also, I think you also said about trying to attend to oneself in that situation and apply meta to oneself so that the situation, you know, the problem, the problems, the kind of circular nature of the problems don't mm -hmm. deplete you. Um, so all of those things, I think, were very, 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 very helpful. And I just wanted to say that I think they have led to not the problems being solved necessarily, <laughs> but to the conversations perhaps being more real, more constructive, more 
fruitful perhaps mm -hmm. no thank you I'm, I'm delighted to hear that that's that's very very encouraging well done <laughs> thanks to you <laughs> mm. Was there anything else that anybody would like to ask or say? I did have a question. Yeah. Hi, my name is. Uh, thank you very much for the for the session today. Um, it seems that Buddhists. The Buddhist principle is to try and be content within oneself. But sometimes um, when things are wrong, it seems that the non-Buddhists get angry and do something about it. They're activists. Can you be a Buddhist and be an activist to change, to change um, the world for the better? Or do Buddhists, are, are they just content with the way things are? That's a very, very significant question. Um, and uh, it's one that there can be a lot of misunderstandings about. Um, I think what would, the way that I would describe um, a Buddhist contribution uh, to the world would be as a skillful activist rather than an unskillful activist. Um, by this I mean, um, I mean, it's, it, and it's, it's probably even more demanding to be a, a skillful activist because um, what it requires is an acceptance of conditions as they are. Um, not an acceptance because you agree with them, but because you recognize that they, they are this way because they couldn't be any other way, but an interest in contributing to um, uh, a change for the better. So what can often happen is that when things are, are, are wrong, as you say, is there can be a feeling of anger and a feeling of... Um, you know, wanting to do something about it, but coming from a very angry place. And if you express your anger, you're actually putting more anger out into the world. Um, and maybe confusion, maybe fear, because often, you know, when things are, seem to be going horribly wrong, we can be very afraid, which is an understandable reaction. You know, it's, it's not, uh, you know, I, I don't blame people for being frightened or being angry, but with the Buddhist practice, we have the capacity, we have the possibility to do better than that, even. Um, by coming to a place of acceptance, we're coming to a place of Dhamma. And from that place, um, there can be a sense of uh, clarity. Um, about what will be the most um, effective response uh, to a situation. <clears throat> so it may be that we just recognize, okay, right now there's nothing I can do about this, but I'm not gonna make it any worse by contributing my anger and my confusion. I'm just going to just calmly accept that this is how things are. It may be that actually you realize there is something you can do, you know, there's, um, or it may be that just in your daily life, conversations that you have with people can have a, a wholesome influence. Um, or maybe you might be able to find yourself you know, writing a letter to a person of, who has some influence. Um, but whatever you do, it's, it's coming from a place of inner balance and wisdom and mindfulness, rather than simply a blind reactivity that you know, may seem to have some kind of effect, but often makes things much, much worse. <clears throat> so the really, the wise people in the world, when you can, you know, when you can speak from a place of calm, a place of presence, um, that voice has a real sense of authority. You know, it's not, <clears throat> it's, 
it's not judging, it's not blaming, it's just saying how things are. And um, that can be have a very, very powerful um, effect. I mean, I find that I'm much more ready to listen to somebody who is um, pointing to a truth that is actually completely obvious when they're doing that in a calm, uh, clear way than if there's a, you know, a, maybe a very compelling, powerful kind of rant uh, that often just makes me feel kind of agitated, you know, so, oh, this per person's really upset. Um, whereas if there's a, you know, if there's a sense of, of precision and clarity, then, you know, it, it, it kind of, it can be a, a uniting um, energy, a, a uniting influence, uh, rather than something that is divisive. <clears throat> so I think it's something that's immensely challenging. Um, and, um, you know, I, as a Buddhist nun, the extent to which I can have an influence is um, somewhat limited because we don't do politics, we don't do war, or <laughs> these, we don't do violence, we don't do those kind of things. Um, Whereas I think as a layperson, you have a, a, a broader range of ways in which you can have an influence. But I really strongly encourage you, don't feel, don't feel helpless or hopeless or that you can't do anything, but may please try to make your actions and your response, may, may your actions and speech be a, a skillful response rather than just adding to the fear and the anger and confusion. There's, there's plenty of that already out there about all kinds of things. Um, some things it's, you know, it can be helpful to get yourself, you know, better informed about certain things. Other things you just, you know, I find I just think, well, I don't really know about that, you know, and I can think, well, it, it makes, you know, I can feel concerned and frightened and, you know, want to do something, but I, you know, I, I can also just say, oh, well, I, I, really don't, I really don't know. Um, and if possible, become more informed if, if it feels that you, you can have some kind of influence, but otherwise just make peace with, okay, well, this is what I can do is I can live my life as a decent human being. That can be my social action. So it's definitely not saying don't do anything, but it's saying try to um, use right speech, right action, right livelihood. This is what the Buddha would encourage rather than to come from a place of anger and fear and confusion. So does that answer the question? I hope so. Give Thank you very much. A pointer. Yeah. Very, very important question. Thank you. We have time for one more question, if there's anything else anybody would like to ask. Otherwise, maybe maybe I can suggest that we end by chanting the um, reflections on universal well-being, which are on page I think it's forty-one in the chanting book. Um, may I abide in well-being? And what I suggest is that we'll chant it, or I'll chant it rather slowly and kind of reflectively. So just you know, if you want to chant along with me, you're welcome to, and just really um, you know, take the words to heart. So you're, it's actually like a kind of, well, almost like a prayer, I suppose, uh, but more a prayer to sort of bring forth those qualities in yourself. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll do that chant and then we'll, we'll end with the, with the closing homage. <clears throat> Now let us chant the reflection on universal well-being. May I abide in well-being, in freedom from affliction, in freedom from hostility, in freedom from ill will in freedom from anxiety, 
and may I maintain well-being in myself. May everyone abide in well-being, in freedom from hostility, in freedom from ill will, in freedom from anxiety, and may they maintain well-being in themselves. May all beings be released from all suffering, and may they not be parted from the good fortune they have attained. When they act upon intention, all beings are the owners of their action and inherit its results. Their future is born from such action, companion to such action, and its results will be their home. All actions with intention, be they skillful or harmful, of such acts, they will be the heirs. And just before we do the closing homage, I'd just like to offer a, a word of encouragement about this business of um, activism, being an activist, just to say that my sense that for each of us, just living our life as Buddhists, uh, making the effort to attune to the refugees, uh, to practice using the precepts, uh, to live our lives in the best way that we possibly can, just that is already a significant contribution to our society. And I think I was saying last time, you know, don't underestimate the uh, significance of that. Um, and allow that to inform whatever other more direct um, causes or um, uh, strategies you align yourself with. So, I'd like to offer that as an encouragement. And we'll just chant the, uh, the closing homage now. <clears throat> the Lord, the perfectly enlightened and blessed one, I render homage to the Buddha, the Blessed One. The teaching so completely explained by him, I bow to the Dhamma. The Blessed One's disciples who have practiced well, I bow to the Sangha. So, wish you well. And uh, keep up the good work. <laughs> if you want to unmute and say bye-bye, you're very welcome to. <laughs> Thank you.